I again, Kenneth Scott Letterette on page 258 of A History of Christianity, dealing with the perils that faced early Christianity. And in this subhead, which is what happened to the new wine, he's already dealt with the issue of can the old wineskins, that is Old Testament Judaism or Judaism as it existed between the two testaments, can that old wineskin or the Roman Empire for that matter contain Christianity? Does Christianity come to save either? And now he says, what happened to the new wine? The old, if the old wineskins were broken by agents other than the new wine of Christianity, and that wine actually preserves something of the wineskins, what happened to the wine? Was it lost or fatally denatured? Or to change the metaphor, was the exceeding greatness of the power weakened by the earthen vessels in which it was at work? To put the question less figuratively, how far, if at all, was the gospel compromised by elements in the culture, in many ways so in contradiction with it, into which it moved and in which it appeared to be victorious. That the gospel was in grave danger of being lost among those who professed to adhere to it must be obvious. It was launched into a hostile world with none of the safeguards which human prudence would have counseled. As we have more than once reminded ourselves, Jesus wrote no book but trusted his teachings and the record of his deeds to the memories of men and women who, though loyal, while he was with them in the flesh, failed really to understand him. He did not utter his words in systematic form, but spoke as the occasion seemed to demand. So far as our evidence goes, he gave almost no thought to an organization to perpetuate his mission. Now, Latteret, of course, is speaking as a mainstream liberal at this point, so Yes, the idea of a development, even within the New Testament, is very, very much there in the liberal way of looking at the evidence of the New Testament. So far as our evidence goes, he gave no thought to an organization to perpetuate his mission. Certainly, he did not create an elaborate organization. Well, that is true, and conservatives would have to agree. Under these circumstances, it would have been natural to expect that coming into a world which was either mis understanding or hostile or both the gospel as it spread would be hopelessly distorted and lost that this happened indeed has repeatedly been said there have been many some of them of great erudition who have declared that jesus is at best a shadowy figure early obscured by his reporters and interpreters and that we can be certain of almost none of his deeds and sayings they see him hidden by layers of tradition and believed the Christianity of the 5th century to have been compounded of Judaism, Greco-Roman polytheism, appropriations from the mystery cults, and Greek thought. This idea is very much with us, of course, today, but Lateret is responding to the prior uh, rush of such ideas back in the early part of the, of the last century. That Christianity was influenced by all these phases of its environment is indubitable. We have had occasion to note some of the contributions from these several sources. But that it, it remained distinct and owed its outstanding qualities to Jesus is both certain and important. So you can see from that statement alone that Lateret is not a radical liberal, although he has liberal suppositions. From Judaism issued the larger part of the scriptures which Christians revered as the inspired word of God. From Judaism came also the belief in one God, much of the ethical standards, the seven-day week with its day of rest and worship, portions of the early forms of worship, the conviction of being a chosen community distinct from the world about it, something of the dream of becoming the universal religion of mankind, baptism, much of the conception of history, and the precedence for a priesthood and of regarding Christ's death as a sacrifice which became outstanding characteristics of Christianity. So all of that is from the root of Judaism. Yet it is one of the striking features of these Jewish legacies that they were thought through in the light of the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, and were interpreted in terms of these and of the teachings of Jesus. The temptation to become simply a variant of Judaism was successfully resisted, and those groups which most nearly conformed to Judaism, dwindled and perished. Moreover, the figure of Jesus, his teachings, and the main events of his life, death and resurrection, stand out so clearly 
in the records contained in the New Testament as to preclude any possibility of their invention or serious distortion. Although some striking similarities to the mystery religions are seen in the story of a divine being slain and risen again, of immortality acquired by sharing symbolically in his death and resurrection, of initiatory rites, and of a sacred meal, there is, as we have suggested, no proof of conscious or even unconscious copying, and the differences between Christianity and the mystery cults are greater than the similarities. We have also seen that Catholic Christianity fought free of absorption into the current non-Christian Gnosticism. While here and there some transfer from Greek and Roman polytheism may have occurred, as in the cults of some of the saints and in a few of the festivals, all of these contributions were profoundly altered to conform with Christian convictions. A major peril was one of attitude, for converts were inclined to expect Christianity to do for them what they had demanded of their pre-Christian gods, but to do it better. Yet the trend of the teaching of the church was towards the progressive weakening of these attitudes and the inculcation of conceptions more nearly in accord with the gospel. In some ways, more serious than any of these threats to Christianity from its environment was the belief in the sharp disjunction between the material and the spiritual world, or in human terms between flesh and spirit, which was prevalent and which appeared axiomatic to many, perhaps the majority, in those elements of the population in which Christianity first made its chief gains. In some of its most extreme forms, notably those represented by the Marcionites, the Gnostics, and the Manichaeans, it was rejected by the Catholic Church. Yet it made itself felt in theology and in the attitude of the rank and file of Christians, notably in the East, and was particularly potent in monasticism and in clerical celibacy. Through these channels, and especially through the last two, it has remained a permanent feature of the churches in which the majority of Christians have been members. As we have noted, it distorted the teachings of Jesus. Yet, as we have seen and, and are to see repeatedly in later chapters, among many of those who espoused it, Christian monasticism was not merely the negative denial of the flesh, but also carried with it the propulsion to go out into the world in an effort to serve and transform individuals and society. So I think Lateret has a very balanced attitude to the pros and cons of the influence of the world and Judaism upon the church. He sees it far more, as a historian, he sees it far more imbalanced than most of us do. I'll put in a link to a discussion of B.F. Westcott on another thing that's uh, usually, at least in those days, was commonly said about Christianity, namely that it borrowed its main concept of the person of Christ from the pagans, the, the Logos doctrine specifically. So what does Westcott have to say on the Logos? Two linked videos, the first of which is on your screen. See you soon.